Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. On this occasion, the portfolio is education and skills. As ever, if uh, a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, I invite them to press the request to speak button to place an RST in the chat function um, during the relevant question. And we start with question number one from Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to ensure that teaching staff across all local authority areas receive additional training on neurodiversity, including autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyspraxia and ADD. Cabinet Secretary. We want all children and young people, including those who are neurodiverse, to get the support needed to reach their full potential. We work closely with partners, including Education Scotland, to ensure teaching staff have access to a range of free professional learning and development resources. This includes the development of free learning modules available via the Open University on both dyslexia and autism inclusive practice. On the 30th of November, we published our updated additional support for learning action plan, which outlines further work we will take in this area to ensure teaching staff continue to receive training to support all children with additional support needs, including those who are neurodiverse. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I'm sure that she will join me in welcoming the launch of the Scottish Borders Council's Neurodiversity Strategy, championed by our fantastic Borders councillors. Do, does she agree that this sets an excellent precedent for how to improve our national curriculum for neurodivergent pupils? And will she explore ways of implementing similar plans across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I thank Rachel Hamilton uh, for uh, bringing the work of the Council uh, to my attention. I would be more than happy uh, to receive further information uh, about what they have achieved and indeed what they hope to achieve in this very important area. And of course, both uh, myself, my officials and Education Scotland will be more than happy uh, to see what lessons can be learned right across the country. So I very much look forward, uh, if Rachel Hamilton would wish, for further, for, for further correspondence on this issue. I've got a number of supplementary. Firstly, Fiona Hislop. Young and neurodiverse constituents tell me that yes, more additional training is needed, but also that small changes to a school day can make a world of difference, such as instigating one-way systems in corridors, reducing busy jostling, something many schools decided to do during COVID, and reducing loud decorative classrooms with overwhelming visual stimulus. Does she agree, and is she satisfied that this is an area which is adequately covered in the Autism School Kit for Schools and being actioned? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I very much agree that listening to the views of young people is vital in this and indeed all areas. As the Young Ambassadors for Inclusion put it in their vision statement, adults in school should act it should ask, listen and act on what the young people say about the support that works best for them. This way of working with and involving children and young people is also set out for local authorities in the statutory guidance and the additional support for learning act. The Autism Toolbox does set out information on sensory differences and what approaches can be taken in place to support young people affected by them. It also provides links to tools like the Sensory Audit for Schools and Classrooms. I can also update that the Autism Toolbox Working Group is currently undertaking work to update the toolbox. This is due for completion in spring 2023 and I would very much welcome um, any specific feedback from Fiona Hislop and her constituents uh, that this working group should consider. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Next year, we will hopefully see the Learning Disability, Autism and Neurodiversity Bill, for which the recruitment of a lived experience advisory panel is currently underway. Does the Cabinet Secretary feel that the Commissioner that is envisaged in this bill will have a part in extending knowledge and experience to teachers and educationalists across Scotland when the bill becomes an act? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it is a, a very important uh, piece of work that the government is undertaking uh, to look at that learning disability, autism and neurodiversity bill, which was obviously part of our programme for government. Uh, Kevin Stewart, the minister who will be taking forward um, this piece of work, um, announced that the government will carry out the scoping work and the remit and powers of the learning disability, autism and neurodiversity bill, including any commissioner um, that could come uh, from that in this parliamentary year. And I very much uh, look forward as I am sure Kevin Stewart does for working with colleagues right across the chamber eh, to make this very important piece of legislation as stringent um, and as useful as it possibly can be. And Mark Ruskell. Um, earlier this year I visited with the Cabinet Secretary uh, Tuke Primary 
um, where we saw the pioneering neuro, neurodevelopmental pathway project being trialled by schools in the area. Um, but I think I'm still hearing from families in Fife who are desperate for this kind of multi-agency support for their children to be, to be rolled out further. So um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether that pilot has concluded, um, what findings were gleaned from the trial, and if the Scottish Government has firm plans to roll out that type of programme uh, to other areas across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Mark Ruskell for that question, and it was indeed a pleasure uh, to accompany him um, on a visit which uh, Kevin Stewart um, undertook. Uh, given this was a pathway project that does sit under health rather than education, uh, if I can perhaps ensure that Mr Stewart um, writes to the member uh, with further details of uh, where that project has got to, and importantly the lessons learned, not just for Fife but right across the country, uh, I will make sure Mr Stewart uh, copies me into that, and um, if Mr Ruskell would like to have further discussions on that, either with myself or with Kevin Stewart, I'm sure we'd be delighted eh, to take that up, given the very useful visit that we did have together. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether a vote in favour of strike action by over 80% and over 90% from members of the UCU and EIS Ooh. trade unions, respectively, is a democratic mandate for strike action. Minister Jamie Hepburn. I recognise that reaching such a threshold provides the legal right to strike under the provisions of the Trade Union Act. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that brief answer? Uh, UCU members were on strike last week and the week before with more action planned. EIS members are taking 16 days of strike action early in the new year. And today, members of the SSTA and NAS UWT are taking part in strike action right across Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary often speaks of a fixed budget. This Parliament does not and never has had a fixed budget. The Cabinet Secretary speaks as well of unaffordability. But when is the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister going to understand that what we really cannot afford is demoralised and undervalued teachers, more disruption to the education of our children, university staff on poor pay and precarious contracts, and a mediocre government that is too indifferent, intransigent and inept to fund a fair pay settlement for the people who work in our universities, our colleges and our schools. Minister. Uh, well, let me first of all say the brevity of my answer was only a reflection of the straightforward nature of the question that uh, was asked of me that was on the, uh, the, the paper. Uh, in terms of uh, what Richard Leonard has said about the Scottish Government not having a, a fixed budget, I, I'm afraid to say, and I'm bound to say, that is inaccurate because what we are talking about is this year's uh, funding uh, settlement. We're talking about this year's pay settlement. In that sense, the budget was fixed. Uh, uh, last year. So we do have a fixed budget. We are operating to a fixed budget. In terms of the uh, respective uh, situations in terms of higher education, uh, I am uh, in regular contact, regular dialogue with unions and management alike. I continue to urge them to engage with uh, one another, to continue to have dialogue to uh, ensure that they can successfully resolve their dispute. The Scottish Government, of course, does not have a direct role in those negotiations. And in respect of the offer that is on the table for uh, teachers, uh, I believe the Scottish Government's clear position is, is a fair uh, settlement and, above all, it is an affordable settlement. The Scottish Government cannot go further in terms of what is on the table, and that is the uh, fact of the matter, President Officer. And supplementary, Stephen Kerr. The, of course, the Scottish Government does have a seat at the table, so that was a disingenuous sort of an answer. Look, pupils, pupils in relation to the school dispute, uh, pupils have had heavily disrupted education for the past two years, for reasons we all know. And now, as we've just heard, this will continue into the new year. So what contingency plans does the Minister have in place to help and support, particularly pupils in the senior phase of their education, to make up for this lost learning and prepare them for very important exams that lie ahead of them in the spring? Minister. Well, let me first of all uh, correct the, uh, Mr Kerr's observation when I was uh, referring to the fact that we're not directly involved in negotiations. That was a specific uh, reference to higher education. I'm sure he understands uh, that is uh, uh, the case. In terms of uh, the contingency we've put in place to support young people, and I think uh, that is the fundamental point, is it not? We need to make sure that young people get the support uh, they deserve. There is a, a range of measures in place through uh, remote learning, through eSchool, to make sure that we support young people uh, in the best fashion we possibly can so they get the support they require.
require so they can do the best they possibly can in the exam period ahead. Question number three was withdrawn. Question number four, uh, Alistair Allen. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Education Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues uh, in relation to the automatic provision by public service bodies of easy read formats to accommodate the needs of people who are neurodiverse. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have had no specific discussions about the automatic provision of easy read formats for people who are neurodiverse. All public bodies are subject to the requirements of the Equality Act of 2010, including provisions to consider reasonable adjustments that take account of people's needs and preferences in certain circumstances. To strengthen this, as part of our current review of the operation of the public sector equality duty in Scotland, we are proposing a new Scottish-specific duty that seeks to ensure inclusive communication is embedded proportionately across the work of listed authorities when they are communicating with the public. The Scottish Government is committed to working with people who are neurodiverse to to improve opportunities, outcomes and support. And to this end, we will introduce a Learning Disability, Autism and Neurodiversity Bill. Alistair Allen. I, I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and I'm encouraged to hear uh, about the work uh, that she proposes. Uh, does she, uh, um, as I'm sure she will, appreciate that, uh, uh, that intervention of that kind is necessary to ensure that uh, all public bodies uh, realise that uh, the provision of um, material, whether it's in Braille or whether it's easy read, is essential uh, to support uh, the inclusion of, of all uh, and ensure the equitable access of all to public services. Can Cabinet Secretary? Well, we are proposing that creation of a new Scottish specific duty that does seek to ensure inclusive communication is embedded proportionately across the work of listed authorities when they're communicating with the public. We ran a public consultation from December 21 to April 22 containing a series of detailed and ambitious proposals for changes to the PSED scheme. Um, this would sit obviously alongside the Scottish Government's other work to embed inclusive communications across the public sector, such as developing national standards, best practice and a monitoring system for the effectiveness on this. And we will, of course, engage further with stakeholders to ensure that any revised regulation and the implementation environment around them can deliver our goal of better outcomes for those who continue to experience inequality. Thank you. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question six, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what work it's undertaking to enhance data collection for educational improvements. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government always aims to improve the availability, quality and consistency of data to extend its understanding on what works to drive forward improvements across all parts of the Scottish education system. More recently, a consultation was launched in May this year and the results from that will inform the 2023 National Improvement Framework and the Improvement Plan. Local stretch aims for improvement and closing the poverty-related attainment gap have been gathered as part of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and will be published this afternoon. I will be making a statement to Parliament emphasising the collective ambition of local authorities to ensure recovery and accelerated progress in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. And this data will provide a strong indicator of ambition and a baseline for improvement. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. And clearly, having useful, informative, and up to date data is essential in driving improvements in education, especially as we look forward to reforms. Can I ask how this enhanced data will help bring about improvements, specifically for those learners in the senior phase of secondary education, so S4, S5, S6 pupils? Thanks. Cabinet Secretary. Well, having access to comprehensive data enables schools and local authorities to analyse their performance within a culture of self-evaluation and reflection, and Education Scotland work with local authorities to provide improvement support. In order to support self-evaluation and improvement at the local level, the Scottish Government provides the Insight benchmarking tool which helps schools to interrogate their own data and use that data to inform improvements and ultimately to improve the outcomes for learners. And supplementary, Pam goes on. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the Education Committee in September, Derek Smale from Glasgow Kelvin College raised concerns about how completion and dropout rates are recorded in Scotland's colleges. When the Minister was in the committee recently, he accepted that improvements are needed in this area and stated, my ambition is to do it as soon as possible. If we do not have accurate data on this issue, we cannot make informed decisions. So can I ask the Minister what work is he undertaking to fix the issues and the data collection on completion and the dropout rates? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, there is uh, work underway on this issue, uh, particular um, issues that we know uh, the system uh, does not uh, deal with adequately at the moment. For example, is someone who leaves their course early, but that may be because uh, they have moved on to another destination. So, for example, began a college course and then actually began university uh, later on, um, or indeed into employment. So, we are very keen uh, to work with the college sector to ensure that the data that is being collected um, is useful and their for um, our ability to improve uh, what is happening um, in the college sector falls from that. Uh, but uh, I am sure the Minister would be delighted uh, to hear more from Ms Gosell on how she thinks we should improve the system. Question number seven, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of its policy, language learning in Scotland, a one plus two approach. Cabinet Secretary. I can report that almost all schools now provide an entitlement under the 1 plus 2 approach. To date, we have invested nearly £37 million to successfully achieve a culture shift in schools with more children learning languages throughout the broad general education than ever before. This year's funding of £2.5 million is supporting local authorities and other partners to deliver professional learning for teachers, provide classroom assistance and deliver school outreach projects. We will continue to consolidate this progress, ensuring that our approach provides the most appropriate access to language learning for Scotland's young people. Emma Roddick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I welcome that the 1 plus 2 language policy has been rolled out in all secondary and the vast majority of primary schools. It is clear from the debate we had in Parliament last month on protecting Scotland's Indigenous languages that the Scottish Government has a strong commitment to language education, but it is important that other minority languages like BSL are not forgotten about. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for an update on progress on outstanding actions in the BSL National Plan? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I fully agree on the importance of BSL as a language of Scotland and making it available for young people to learn. The Government is working with Education Scotland, Scotland's National Centre for Languages and others to promote BSL to local authorities and to ensure that teaching resources are available. In terms of progress, we surveyed local authorities on language learning last year and over 100 primary schools reported providing BSL as part of their 1 plus 2 offer. This is a significant increase on previous years and demonstrates the investment we have made to improve language learning in delivering positive outcomes. In the longer term, I hope that this will lead to an improved understanding of BSL and the deaf community and culture in Scotland. And we will continue our progress with the publication of the new BSL National Plan for 23-29 next October. And a couple of supplementaries. First, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government if it will review the 1 plus 2 language policy to bring it more in line with the European language framework to help Scotland prepare to return to the EU as an independent member state. Cabinet Secretary. As the member may know, the 1 plus 2 approach was developed based on the principles of the European Council's 2002 Barcelona Agreement, which called for countries to teach at least two foreign languages from an early age. We will continue to look to European best practice as we consider the future of language learning in schools, but I am pleased that our overall approach is aligned to European principles. Our approach supports young people to be more confident communicating with each other and with the people from Europe and indeed around the world. This is essential if they are to become global citizens and if they are to participate in our institutions. And Stephen Kerr. And a reality check. Because, because between 2018 and 22, there was a 34 decline percent decline in the number of entries at higher French and a 38 percent decline in the number of entries at higher German. And this compares to England, where over the same period there was a 5 percent increase in GSE French and a 12 percent increase in German. The SNP love to parade their European <laughs> credentials. And yet what is the reality? The reality is that we are in a country where young people are being deprived of the opportunity to develop the ability to learn other languages and because of language, other cultures. Is the minister concerned that under the SNP take-up of French and German, there is such a dramatic decline compared with other parts of the United Kingdom? Oui. Cabinet Secretary. Oui, oui. Well, I uh, notice um, in this instance that Mr Kerr is quite happy to make comparisons between England and uh, Scotland, and I look forward uh, to him therefore not making any comments if I ever do the same um, in reverse, uh, Presiding Officer. But I do recognise a very important point that Mr Kerr uh, brings up uh, about languages. It's important to note that the cohorts that will have benefited from the full language entitlement 
in the 10 years of BEG will not have yet progressed uh, to the senior phase. So the full impact of the 1 plus 2 policy in terms of national qualification entrances and pass rates has yet to be seen. Uh, but I do recognise there is more uh, to do um, in this area and we perhaps did not get into it uh, in the um, Conservative Party debate on education yesterday. But if Mr Kerr would like to be forward concrete suggestions and proposals uh, about what can be done rather than just criticising, I would be more than happy to receive them. Question number eight, Rose McCall. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government to ask the Scottish Government what work it is doing to tackle the reported staffing crisis within the early years sector. Mr. Clare Hawhey. Uh, Presiding officer, Scotland's childcare workforce has increased by 7,750 posts between 2016 and 2021 to deliver a transformational investment in 1140 hours of funded early learning and childcare. And unlike other parts of the UK, the overwhelming majority of funded providers in Scotland pay at least the real living wage. However, I recognise that as with many areas of the economy, there are workforce challenges in the childcare sector and we are committed to working with the sector to address these. That's why we are working with our partners to develop a strategic framework for Scotland's childcare profession. The framework will set out priorities for action across key areas, including recruitment and retention of staff, and we will publish the framework in the new year. Ms McCall. Uh, I thank the Minister for the answer. The Scottish Childminding Association announced recently that 34% of childminders have quit the profession since the expansion of the funded early education childcare in 2016. They warned this figure could rise to a staggering 64% by July 2026, with over 10,500 10 childminding places being lost as a result. Two years ago, the Scottish Childminding Association warned that there was a workforce crisis coming, and today that crisis is here, and their calls appear to have fallen on deaf ears. So does the Minister... How does the Minister plan to not only stop the exodus of childminding from the profession, but also replace the 2,000 childminding businesses that are already closed? Minister. So uh, I thank the member for that question. Um, we are committed to building a vibrant, thriving childminding sector and to promoting childminding, along with other roles across the ELC sector, as a valued and a fulfilling career choice. Um, and we welcome the SEMA's annual audit and the updated evidence it provides us in the involvement of childminders in funded ELC. We want to encourage more people into childminding and we're working with the Scottish Childminding Association and other partners to address the decline in the childminding workforce, a trend that is mirrored elsewhere in the UK. And we also want to see new childminding services developing in areas with limited access to this form of ELC. And that's why we're supporting a recruitment pilot being led by the SCMA and partners, aiming to recruit and train 100 new childminders in remote and rural areas. Okay, I've got a number of supplementaries. The supplementaries are going to have to be brief, as indeed are the answers. First, Graham Day. I thank you, President. Officer. The government, I'm sure, will be taking a range of actions to help ensure Scotland is a sustainable childcare sector. I wonder if, for the benefit of the Chamber, the Minister could outline these. As briefly as possible, Minister. I will certainly try to be brief. We are committed to supporting a sustainable, diverse and thriving childcare sector and alongside maintaining a robust but proportionate means of monitoring the financial sustainability of the sector. We are providing support through providing the funding to allow councils to pay sustainable rates to private and third sector providers and to childminders for the delivery of funded ELC, legislating to continue the Nursery Rates Relief Scheme, which provides 100% relief on non-domestic rates to eligible day nurseries beyond the 30th of June 2023, and progressing the actions set out in the Financial Sustainability Health Check, including funding pilot programmes of targeted business gateway support, which will be available to all childcare services. And Michael Mara. Presiding officer, I have been contacted by a number of deeply concerned constituents regarding the lack of early years care available in Huntley in Aberdeenshire. The Minister may be aware that one of the providers in the town, called Kiddlywinks, has announced its closure in the coming weeks due to the concerns the care inspectorate have regarding the quality of the building. Aberdeenshire Council so far appear to be unwilling to plug the gap and families are reporting they may have to give up work in a cost of living crisis. Will the Minister commit to working with the owners of the nursery and the care inspectorate to find a solution that keeps this vital service open? Minister. 
Minister. Well, of course, Mr Mara will be aware that local authorities have a legal duty to ensure that every child can access a place, no matter where they reside. And I would be happy if Mr Mara could write to me with the details of that particular nursery and have my officials look into the difficulties those parents are experiencing. Willie Rennie. I am sure the Minister is uncomfortable that one of her predecessors agreed that staff in private and voluntary nurseries are paid much less than their counterparts in council nurseries. So what steps is she taking to close the gap with fair and equal funding, no matter where staff work? Minister. So, as I'm sure Mr Rennie is aware, our funding agreement with COSLA allows councils to pay sustainable rates for funded ELC hours to private and third sector providers and to childminders. And the Joint Scottish Government and COSLA guidance published in May this year is clear that rates should reflect up-to-date information on the costs of delivery and provide scope for reinvestment and enable delivery of the real living wage commitment. Um, while the funding to providers in the third and private sector and childminding sectors is an important element of local authority ELC budgets, this funding must also cover a wide range of other costs. For example, as I said to Mr Mara, local authorities have a legal duty to ensure every child can access a place no matter where they live and they have to provide uh, services that would not be commercially viable for other providers. And for Mr um, Rennie's information, on average, the funding to private and voluntary um, uh, providers, thank you, uh, for 11, uh, 11 40 years funded ELC, that equates to between 33 and 45 per cent of their income. I'm going to have to set homework on the definition of brief, but very brief, Brian Whittle. Are we sitting comfortable? No. Um, <laughs> there, there is, following on from Willie Rennie's question, there is a, an issue with disparity of facilities that are able to be offered to nursery, nursery staff in the private sector and the public sector. Um, so what can the Scottish Government do to try and prevent the drift away from the public sector nurseries of staff into the public sector? Minister. So, um, recruitment and retention of the childcare workforce with the right skills, values and attributes remains a priority and given the tight labour market it is a key challenge and we have taken a number of actions to support the recruitment and retention in the childcare workforce including providing funding to local authorities to enable them to set local sustainable rates, working with the SSSC to invite those whose registrations have lapsed in recent years to rejoin the sector, providing resources to support recruitment to all parts of the sector and working with partners on childminder specific recruitment programmes. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions.